My name is Bronwyn Bruton and I am the director of the Africa Center at the Atlantic Council, which is dedicated to promoting US partnerships with African nations and institutions, strengthening security and bolstering African prosperity. Thank you for joining us today. It's become a cliche for journalists and politicians to conclude their remarks by declaring that we need a Marshall Plan for Africa. It sounds like a nice pro-Africa thing to say, but in fact, it's also profoundly cynical. To say that Africa needs a Marshall Plan is essentially to say that Africa is as much a wreck and a ruin as Europe in the aftermath of World War II. In a worst case scenario, it can be a polite way of saying that Africa is hopeless and there's not very much that we can do. That's possibly why Vera Sangwe, head of the UN Commission for Africa, has publicly rejected the idea of a Marshall Plan for Africa, saying that efforts are better focused on trade, and particularly the creation of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, and not on more and more rounds of aid. She has a great point, but a growing range of very serious people, including investment expert Aubrey Ruby, former Republican Congressman David Bratt, and even renowned, internationally renowned, aid skeptic Dambiza Moyo disagree. We're here to find out why. Directing our conversation today is Mr. Gabriel Nagatu, Senior Fellow at the Africa Center and former East Africa Director General at the African Development Bank. In short, a person who knows both trade and aid. If you have a question for this remarkable panel, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you're joining us on the webinar. And if you're watching us online, please write to us at AC Africa, uh, sorry, Twitter <laughs> at AC Africa. Thanks for being here. And Mr. Gabriel Nagatu, thank you for hosting us. Over to you. Good morning, uh, morning again, everyone. Uh, my name is Gabriel Nagatu, and I have the privilege of uh, facilitating this morning's uh, conversation. Uh, my job is easy. My job is to introduce the uh, eminent speakers that we have lined up for you, and then uh, to, to kickstart the, the discussion. So this morning, we are joined by three distinguished panelists. And uh, let me quickly introduce them without taking up uh, too much of your time. The first uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Dambisa Moyo, a name that most of you are quite familiar with. Dr. Moyo is a preeminent thinker and a thought leader on microeconomics, geopolitics, and technology themes. She previously worked at the World Bank and Goldman Sachs before becoming an author and an international public speaker with four New York Times bestsellers. If you haven't read Moyo, then you haven't been following Africa. She also sits on the board of uh, several corporations, including 3M, Chevron, and Condé Nast. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. David Bratt. He's the Dean of Liberty University in Virginia and the School of Business. Dave is a former US Congressman, having represented Virginia's seventh congressional district from 2014 to 2019, and has consulted with the World Bank as an economist, and Dave brings a wealth of uh, knowledge uh, to, to this conversation. And the third panelist is our own Miss Aubrey Herbie. Aubrey is a senior fellow with the Africa Center, as well as the co-founder of Insider and the African Experts Network. She has consulted extensively in 25 African markets, advises senior policymakers and Fortune 500 companies on doing business in Africa. Aubrey writes regularly on US-Africa trade. So this is the team of uh, experts we have assembled for you. So just to kickstart, I think the uh, rapid uh, spread of COVID-19 in Africa has upended life in the continent in ways that were never contemplated. On both the health side, the economic side, and the social and political side, and so on. And the case for a, a Marshall Plan type of intervention has never been greater and the time has never been uh, uh, more urgent. Therefore, I'm going to ask each of my panelists, starting with you, uh, Dr. Moyo, to give us, uh, to take about three minutes to, uh, fra to uh, frame your uh, thoughts on this and then we'll 
start the Q and A interactive session, and then we will subsequently take questions from the from the panel. So, without any delay, let me hand it over to Dr. Moyo. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to um, to join you today to um, really talk about an, an issue that is not only important but quite urgent. Um, I must say that I, it's quite regrettable that uh, Vera Songwe was not herself on this call because I suspect her views around the importance and the, the need for a, uh, a Marshall Plan, quote unquote, um, perhaps be, would be much more nuanced than, uh, than perhaps is being portrayed um, more generally in, in the media. Um, the, to me, the argument for a short, sharp, and finite intervention, similar to the 1948 to 1952 intervention of the Marshall Plan into Europe is quite compelling. Um, as uh, was mentioned during the introduction, um, about 10 years ago, I wrote a book, which was quite a, a damning critique of large scale aid programs um, from developed nations and developed organizations, um, developing country uh, focused organizations um, to developing countries. And I, I won't go through the whole list of why I felt that fundamentally um, that those types of aid programs were unsustainable, um, but you know, certainly the arguments about corruption, around inflation, around Dutch disease, which was undermining the, lo the local export sector, um, were just some of the points that I raised um, and, and I felt um, were critically important. Um, however, I was very clear um, in not only that book 10 years ago, Dead Aid, but also more recently in the article that I published in The Economist magazine um, about the need for a Marshall Plan, that we are in particular circumstances where the evidence has shown, not just because of the Marshall Plan, but more generally, that there is an important um, imperative um, for large countries um, to, to think about putting together some kind of relief package for, um, for Africa. Um, let me start by just giving a little bit more context to the Marshall Plan. Um, it was a, a plan between 1948 and 1952. It was designed um, to basically support reconstruction of Europe um, in the post-war era. It was approximately $135 billion in today's money. Um, and so just in terms of the specific um, uh, what I think is very appealing in the Af African context is that it was short, it was shine, it was it was finite, and it was very sharply um, targeted. And I, I, I suspect one of my other uh, colleagues on this call will be able to talk a little bit more about how expansive that that approach was. Um, but nevertheless, I think there are three reasons uh, in particular why um, it is important um, for us to reconsider without getting so focused on labels um, of, of a Marshall Plan, why it's important for us to think about uh, a new program of intervention into the African uh, continent. Um, the first point is a health imperative. Um, according to the World Health Organization, um, emerging market countries, but in general, um, in poor places in wealthy countries, we should be spending on average around 34 to $40 per, per, per person per year. Many African countries, and it's not just an African problem, but around the world, even in, in poor uh, areas of developed countries, the um, amount of money spent on healthcare is falling far below that number. Um, so just in terms of an in capital infusion to support the health sector, it seems to me that some form of Marshall Plan is, is quite, uh, quite compelling. The second point is an economic one. Um, I strongly believe we have not yet started, uh, started to see the full impact and second order effects of what a healthcare uh, a tragedy in the pandemic, um, will, what costs us will, will um, be unleashed on the economic sector. Um, we have we have already seen the IMF call for um, their expectation of a minus 5.9 percent decline in the economy. The truth is, even before the pandemic um, hit, the global economy was in a, a an era heading towards an era of slow and low economic growth, with serious concerns around around the impotence of public policy, both in terms of fiscal and monetary policy, serious concerns around the debt and deficits 
um, of, of countries. And, and perhaps most poignantly, given the, the opening remarks here, um, there were serious concerns around deglobalization. So the notion that we should be thinking about more trade um, in Africa, it, it feels a little bit late to be banging on about that at a time when, um, whether it's trade, whether capital flows, whether it's immigration to movement of people across borders, or indeed even just the movement of ideas, the global idea of globalization um, is, has been under threat. So suffice it to say, economically, African countries, not just African countries around the world, countries are vulnerable um, to a, a depression-like scenario. Um, the third point that I make, aside from healthcare and economic arguments, um, to me, the most important point um, in terms of urgency from a Western standpoint is relevance. Um, there is a geopolitical uh, tug of war going on. We know about this. It's been going on for over a decade now between the West and, and China. Um, and China, by, by far, whether it's in foreign direct investment, whether it's in trade, um, whether it's in the ownership of debt, um, there are infrastructure programs through the BRICS banks and uh, the, uh, the uh, Belt and Road. Um, China has made considerable inroads to such an extent that today China is the biggest lender, um, not just to the U.S. government um, as a foreign lender to the U.S. government, but it is also the biggest lender um, uh, in terms of uh, debt to the emerging markets, um, surpassing uh, many other agencies. So in, in summation, really, we need some kind of a package, not just to support healthcare um, in this um, very tumultuous times, and not just to support economics, but we absolutely need, if there is to be an ideological argument coming from the West, the West will need to stamp its imprimatur um, in the emerging markets in general, but in Africa specifically. Um, otherwise, the ideological debate between democratic market capitalist states versus um, state capitalist states that deprioritize democracy, such as China, is essentially already lost to the West if they can't even be bothered to, to compete uh, at this time. Um, I will close by just saying uh, to some, this whole idea of a Marshall Plan, asking for at least a trillion dollars um, uh, to, to pursue um, some kind of package for health, economics, and geopolitic, geopolitical stability may seem fanciful. After all, Western countries are themselves struggling under a heap of debt um, uh, and massive deficits that are to a large part seen as unsustainable. And of course, the low growth scenario that I mentioned earlier and a lot of other aspects um, that are eroding their own economies. Um, but I do think it is important that this debate in a sensible way is brought back to the table um, if we are to address the multitude of challenges, economic, geopolitical, social, um, and environmental that the global economy um, is likely to face in the next decade and, and onwards. So brilliant. I will stop there. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dambisa. That was uh, excellent. Uh, Aubrey, uh, Dambisa has uh, spelled out the three imperatives for a uh, Marshall Plan-like uh, initiative. Can you also give us, uh, in, in, in a few minutes, the imperative from your perspective? Over to you, please. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, pleasure to be on this esteemed panel. Um, so I, first of all, agree that with Dambisa about skepticism around aid. I have lived my whole career in that realm. I don't believe a lot of the aid proje projects have um, achieved the goals. And so, yes, I have a deep skepticism. Um, but I've also had a lifetime inspiration by the Marshall Plan. I can really look to it as, I think, one of the greatest examples of enlightened self-interest and learning from history um, and that we didn't want Germany to pay reparations again, which led, you know, between the interwar period to World War II. Um, but there's been many as called for the Marshall Plan over the last uh, four decades for Africa. And I think the issue there is that people don't tend to understand of the structure of the Marshall Plan, which actually made it work. And for those of us on this call and on this panel who've done a lot of business in African markets, uh, you all know that execution is everything. And so if you can't execute something in a meaningful way, then this aid could go down the same path uh, as the aid before. 
And so for me, really, there are five elements of the Marshall Plan that need to be considered in any discussion around a big aid push for African markets. The first was that there was a focus on productivity. Uh, the Marshall Plan was in part an effort to restore European productivity. And we know uh, there's been a ton of work done by uh, CGD and others on African firm level productivity. And we know at a, both a farm and firm level that African productivity is much lower uh, per worker than it is in, in Asia, for example. And so this question of how you design a program focused on productivity, particularly industrial productivity, is very important. We know African markets today are less industrial than they were in 1980. So there's a deindustrialization taking place and any intervention <coughs> needs to address productivity at the core. Secondly, the Marshall Plan had a conditionality of integration. So economic integration was core to the Marshall Plan effort. Uh, you know, the first customs union really came to be as a in Europe as a result of the Marshall Plan really coming to fruition in 1950. And so getting the uh, European countries that decided to participate, because remember the Marshall Plan was offered to Russia and the European or Eastern European countries, um, but those that decided to participate had to come up with joint plans. That's where you had European steel and coal community. So you literally had a conditionality of integration. The third element that is very important was that there was a huge mobilization of private sector expertise. So in that effort to increase productivity, uh, hundreds of experts from you know high levels of the Ford Motor Company to John Deere to all very large industrial U.S. companies uh, spent time in Europe. There was exchanges back and forth. There was actually a chunk of money allotted, uh, five million dollars, where it, at the time to bring 350 experts to Europe from the U.S. and 480 to um, uh, sorry, vice versa, 350 to Europe and then 480 to the US to study and to really get these areas of productivity. You saw that also in Asia when you when you look at the Japanese and the Korean transformation and the US role in the in those transformations. Um, there was also a focus on forex. Uh, most European countries because they had no more export capacity were not earning forex. And <clears throat> that is the same case that you see today in many African countries. Right now Nigeria has a shortage of forex Ethiopia has a short shortage because exports aren't happening. And those that were dependent on oil exports obviously are getting less per barrel. So this restriction on Forex obviously hampers productivity because you cannot import inputs. Uh, so there was an element of getting dollars in the hands of European companies so that they could rebuild their productivity. That piece would be very key in a future Marshall Plan for Africa if we were to move forward. And lastly, the Marshall Plan reinforced democratic structures. So loans were given directly to companies in Europe as a product, as a, as a product of the Marshall Plan. And those loans were then paid back to European governments in the form of taxes. So you actually increased the tax base during that time. We know that African countries, particularly the oil dependent ones, have a very, very low tax base relative to their GDP. So any kind of direct uh, direct transfers to Africans, as Dambisa called for in her article, would need to be also paid back and increased in increasing the tax base. Um, so I think thinking about the actual structures of what made the Marshall Plan a unique uh, success when it comes to global aid are very important in considering any future big push of aid towards African markets. The last thing I would say is that um, you know, to discuss something meaningful, it has to be feasible. And I think people mis, uh, misunderstand or don't understand the uh, lack of the, the effort that was put in to sell the Marshall Plan to the American people. Um, between August and November 1947, over 200 members of Congress visited Europe on fact-finding missions. So almost half of the U.S. Congress spent time in the region understanding the issues on the ground. And that brought, brought, you know, created an incredible level of real expertise, direct experience, and it brought a buy-in from uh, Congress that translated in part to buy-in from the American people. So by the beginning of, of 1948, over two-thirds of Americans had heard about the Marshall Plan, and there was a PR effort at the time called a Marshall Plan for the Marshall Plan. 
because there was such a view that there needed to be buy-in. And anything at a trillion dollars that will go external to the United States or from European countries would need that level of buy-in because we know as a fact that Americans don't have any sense of the real amount of aid that we give. Um, so, you know, thinking about execution is very important at this point. Um, and so I'll leave it at that. Okay. I've been one that to critique calls for Marshall plans in the past because I think they just uh, overlook the structures that made, make, made it work. And unfortunately, without those structures, we would go down the same path of the aid that, that, that um, Deb Bisa criticized in Dead Aid. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Gabriel. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Aubrey, and uh, for the uh, imperatives you've laid out. And I think we'll have a chance to come back to them. Uh, let me now come back to Congressman uh, Dave. Dave, from where you sit or where, where you've been sitting in this age of America first and Brexit and what have you, how do you, how do you see the, this whole uh, call for master plan uh, being, uh, a Marshall plan being played out? Over to you, Dave. Yeah, well, thank you very much, and thanks for having me with you today. Uh, I agree with the comments. Uh, they did all the heavy lifting on uh, the first two panelists, did a great job setting it up. Uh, I'll just make some remarks as a uh, former congressman that I think uh, I followed Danny Roderick and his work on bottlenecks at the World Bank. I, my mind kind of thinks that way. I followed Doug North on institutions. And so when I think about the Marshall Plan, uh, I go back to the, the broader liberal Bretton Woods order we set up after World War II. And uh, we, we did that, and I always make reference to this uh, in, in contrast to China with our arch enemies, right? The Judeo-Christian tradition is probably a part of that uh, momentum. And so we made friends with uh, our arch enemies, uh, the Japanese and the Germans, and we made hard moves and said, uh, okay, let's work together, uh, but you're gonna have to redo your politics uh, with major implications to power bases in your own country uh, going forward, and uh, in addition to their European, uh, you know, economic uh, setup. And so why is that important? We're kind of at a unique historic moment right now, ironically, with President Trump in office tearing down the establishment on my Republican side and the Democrat side. And so what's this have to do with uh, African development? Well, over 30 or 40 years, you know, I taught economics and development economics and growth economics for 20 years. Uh, what are the bottlenecks? What are the impediments? And the answer is it's the politics and if you and corruption, right? Political corruption, setting up the institutions you need to be successful so that you can accumulate capital. Capital is second order. You got to first have political stability before capital wants to move anywhere. And so it's kind of ironic that, uh, you know, the World Bank by its charter is not supposed to touch political variables, right? I, I did cross-country regressions for 20 years and you couldn't put, I did, I put them in and the T-stats blew off the roof, uh, but the bank's not allowed to put political variables in there. They don't want to get hot. They don't want to get in those discussions and you can't deal with religion. Well, last time I checked, when you read the uh, broad swath of human history, those are the two most powerful forces uh, that exist. And if you don't have a revolution from below, uh, nothing's going to work out. And so right now we are, we're at a unique moment uh, where everyone realizes China's the elephant in the room. They do not share any of those uh, shared values across this Bretton Woods, modern liberal order. Uh, and so it's crucial that the African countries make a commitment uh, to tear down their corruption. And that means going after your friends and the billionaires in those countries, right? So I think the UN did a study over 1.4 trillion dollars in uh, illicit funds have been uh, sent abroad from Africa. So there's a huge chunk uh, of funding right there to make this thing take off. And then on the U.S. side, we just had the pandemic and we're still, you know, spiking in various areas. And we have, a, you know, we're increasing aggregate demand, for, you know, just the government spending. And we found out in the last few days, some of that money has flowed to Chinese CCP firms, right? our own aid through our elites uh, and our billionaire class that props up China because they've been growing for 10%. So both sides have to come clean and we've got to get rid of the old order. And it, when we say America first over here, it doesn't mean we don't want to link up with the rest of the world. Uh, we want to make friends uh, with all countries. And I, I think the US has a better track record of, on that order than, than China does. 
And so uh, my, get, getting down to brass tacks, uh, my friend Jonas Biru, uh, economist, uh, World Bank economist, a good friend of mine, uh, he's been writing uh, for a while and he, you know, he's got a few solutions on how do you fund this? And that, you know, that the first is to get at that illicit funding. And then the second is to give some tax breaks uh, to bring the supply chains uh, back to the U.S. And the African countries are a natural ally there uh, for that shift. And then thirdly, he he notes so uh, we can do some uh, venture capital funds and and uh, put some funds together with the, the African diaspora. So th- there are ways uh, to make this happen financially, uh, which is the hard part. But for me, it, the crux of it uh, is the African countries have to make it very clear what they're going to do on the corruption front so that capital can flow. If, if you're going to have a private sector initiative, capital's not flowing anywhere, right? At the, at the individual level, at the firm level, same thing, same logic operates at the national level. You got to have a, an attractive uh, home base for that capital flight. And then in the U.S., we've got to do our part uh, so that we make friends with the right countries. And uh, I, I think Sub-Saharan Africa and the, and the Horn of Africa are, are natural friends and allies. And so uh, I'll just end my comments right there. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, uh, it's it's a politics. And uh, that's a very good springboard. Uh, let me now... Uh, the questions are coming in, so I'm, I'm going to try and summarize a few. So, Dambisa, let me throw the first one uh, at you. Uh, one of the key lessons that we've taken from the uh, uh, Marshall Plan is not so much the size of the envelope as it were, but the types of reform and cooperation that, that ensued. And I've also been reading uh, Jonas Biru, uh, a prominent economist from the World Bank, and his biggest, one of his biggest suggestions is that, yes, we need a, a Marshall Plan, but strongly underpinned by strong governance reform. So the MISA, given that there has not been enough reforms in governance and institution building and so on, how do you then propose such a massive type of aid and in, in, in the direct cash uh, scheme that you've proposed uh, without the concomitant uh, reforms in institutions and governance. Uh, over to you, Dambisa. Um, so thank you. Uh, you know, one of my great frustrations is uh, I turned 50 years old last year, and for some reason, the narrative and discussion around the African continent is just not changing. Uh, we always talk about corruption, we talk about poverty, we talk about war, we talk about disease, the lack of institutions, and it's deeply frustrating to me that um, we seem to be repeating ourselves um, year in, year out, generations that came before me, um, and clearly um, we're not moving the needle aggressively enough to change the narrative for generations that are coming after. Um, you know, to answer your question specifically, I'm an eternal optimist that technology actually is one route that will allow us to circumvent some of the trauma and the sort of second order dead weight losses that we've seen um, by relying on institutions and political machinations that uh, David alluded to that perhaps have created these negative um, outcomes uh, in the past. So in my article, again, in The Economist, I, I talk about um, remittances and um, you know, new ways of transferring capital. Um, and and you ha- I, my view is you have to be optimistic that, uh, um, that there are new patterns, new opportunities for innovation in much the same way that we're innovating how we eat, how we travel, how we communicate. Um, it just cannot be um, same, same uh, regarding the uh, interaction and engagement uh, where Africa is concerned. Um, if it were that, I would be back to my original book. Um, to say that these types of programs will be long-term undermining for uh, human progress and living standards. But, you know, really what I, I'm, I'm driving towards is that we are living in an, a new era of greater de- deglobalization, um, larger government uh, responsibility, more important government as an arbiter of capital and labor, um, private sector shrinking, private sector becoming much more concentrated. And to me, that world is, is much more um, akin to a world where uh, you, you'll see much more scope for innovation um, to circumvent some of those barriers. And, and the, the concept of aid, um, or certainly transfers to support healthcare, education, and ultimately to keep the West in particular competitive geopolitically, um, seems to me 
to be ripe for uh, much more technological engagement and, and uh, import. So that, that's how I'm thinking about those types of, of, of institutional uh, hurdles. Good, and, good. Th and Gabriel, thank maybe, you. Yeah. maybe I can jump in there as well. Please come in, yeah. Um, because I too, I mean, Dembisa and I maybe share a same birthday year of some sort. I turned 40 last year and also am frustrated by the constant focus on uh, corruption in any conversation on Africa, because while she may take an optimistic view, I take a historical one. And let's remember that the United States for at least 120 years, the most requested presidential appointment was head of Customs House New York because of the ability to skim off. And our, you know, gilded age was defined by corruption. And look at the number of mayors in America today who are in jail for, you know, local level uh, corruption. The difference is, is that there here is there's a tension between the business community and the uh, political establishment that makes for better governance. And so you have an option if you want to be influential wealthy, successful, you do not have to always be a minister or a cabinet secretary in the United States or developed countries. You can be in business your whole life. We need more Dan Gotes in African markets. There are only 400 companies that do over a billion US revenue a year in the region. That's a problem because there's not enough of a tension between the business community and government that makes for better government over time as they check each other. And so a Marshall Plan, the way it was designed originally, um, it shored up the business community in Europe. Um, and that was a very important aspect of it. In fact, even in the United States, there was a committee for the passage of the Marshall Plan that had over 300 members that included business leaders, generals, uh, religious leaders, academics, et cetera, a whole broad swath of society, which it also increased democratic participation. So I actually think you need the capital, you need the business activity before you get good governance. And I think the history of European countries and uh, U.S. shows that. So I guess I disagree with Dr. Bratt on making it a prerequisite from day one to have better institutions before investment comes. I think the investment comes and in that process makes better institutions. Okay, let, let me stay on uh, Aubrey because... Hey, well, let me go on that one for one second. Okay, Dave. Yeah, very quickly, I, I, please. I just want to offer a word of caution on the technological hopes uh, because when you talk about the Gilded Age, we got a second Gilded Age right now. It's in the United States right now, and it's in the technology sphere. Six firms are driving our entire stock market. So in economics, you have perfect competition. That means there's a lot of firms competing. We have total monopolies in the U.S. right now Google, Facebook, Amazon, Twitter, right down the line. The big press is all, Washington Post is owned by Amazon. And that's why you're going to have a hard time. So we've got income inequality over here, but no one wants to really address the billionaire class, right? People are going after the wrong variables. And so when you want to make a deal with the U.S. right now, you're right. You can be rich in business here. They own the politicians. I was in Congress, right? I was on the budget committee and they told us what was in the budget at the beginning of the year before we started doing our work, just to give you a hint at how corrupt it is over here. All the money are tied to special crony capitalist deals with lobbyists up in DC. And that includes relationships with Africa. And so if you're gonna get Africa in play, uh, you got some heavy lifting to do over here uh, because right now people care more about investing in China because they've had 10% growth rates and our firms are just schizophrenic, right? We got Larry Fink with BlackRock doing ESG liberal investing over here on the environment and liberal social justice. And they tell, put, tells his folks to put half your money in China, who's not known for their clear skies and human rights track record. So that's what I, I'm just trying to tell folks what the constraints really are. But, but uh, you but need to go after our our billionaire class and get them to be friends of Africa. Uh, they control our politicians. It's 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 not uh, vice versa. Good, uh, Dembisa. Before you come in, though, could you also address the issue of uh, not only corruption here, but the issue of institutions and 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 rules that ensure accountability of this type of massive aid? But go ahead, Dembisa. Yeah, so I think I, I kind of touched on the the the, the second point um, already that that you know clearly institutions have have failed us in large part, and I think it's it's very apropos that both my colleagues are referring to the Gilded Age. They are right that the period from 1870 to the early 1900s in the United States 
has, there are many, many um, characteristics of that period that we see today, income inequality, um, you know, the issue of concentration of, and, and essentially monopolies and oligopolies in not just the technology sector, um, but also in pharmaceuticals, banking, you know, energy companies, mining companies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And indeed, even in, with institutional investors, you mentioned the BlackRock, um, but there are others uh, as well. Um, and so, yes, there there is that point to be made about um, the, the the sort of uh, history repeating itself. Um, I would just caution um, about sort of handing it off. And my question and my intervention really where Dr. Bratt was concerned was to say you were there, you were in the coalface um, of government. I mean, you know, you, you say we should go after the billionaires, which is completely antithetical to the American sense of the American dream and capitalism, um, which is a sort of a more ideological debate. But, you know, what, why, what is it that, and I don't mean to be um, sort of uh, poignant, and I'm not pointing at you specifically, but what is going on in the U.S. government, um, the political class that is actually going to reform some of these things? I mean, we hear about antitrust legislation, very much the sh similar to the Sherman Act, coming back with a vengeance um, starting just this month when there'll be debates um, with the, the tech, uh, tech leaders. But I, I just think it's easy to pass it. Somebody is going to blame someone else all the time. And, and this maybe fundamentally last point is, is why I think that um, Africa's growth narrative has to emerge um, despite or in spite of institutions. Um, and I think there's a real opportunity for technology to provide to provide that, um, you know, unlike um, Dr. Bratt, I'm not of the, the view that it's only because of these four companies um, the, that the mark, stock market is up. We've had a massive stimulus program. Most of the people who are participating in this upside are actually not institutional investors, they're retail investors. And so the notion that we should we can actually quickly pinpoint who's at fault here, um, I, I, my, set, my central view is that the government sets up the state, uh, sets up the environment um, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of education. We are failing, not just in, in Africa, but also in the United States. Um, in terms of being forward leaning, in terms of being data driven, measured outcomes, in terms of being serious about being competitive, um, it's not just an African problem, it's also clearly the problem in the United States. Okay, uh, Dave, let me let me come to you, but let me also pose another question and then I'll ask you to respond. You've raised China in, in, in your opening statement and uh, we'd be remiss if we did not discuss China a bit here. Uh, yeah. The US clearly has shown a fervent desire to retreat from um, multilateralism by withdrawing from international treaties and international organizations. Of course, most recently the WHO. By doing so, the U.S. is in effect uh, relinquishing uh, its leadership in global governance. Meanwhile, meanwhile, China is stepping up and uh, increasing its activity internationally uh, and is promoting influential initiatives such as the Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI, a new, a new Marshall Plan of sorts from China. Now, given the, the, the threat that we, we all understand China, uh, face China poses to the U.S., uh, how eager or how ready is the U.S. to counter the Belt and Road Initiative with a master plan, with the Marshall Plan for Africa? Uh, because without it, then uh, China will probably take the, uh, take the lead on this. So could you answer yeah. that? Yeah, and so uh, the, the retreat from multilateralism doesn't mean we're not going to be uh, invested in the world still. I think it's just going to be in a different way, and it's going to be more reliant on the Marshall Plan logic uh, of using markets uh, and those relationships. And so, you know, in Europe, you can look at Chinese Huawei, right? They, every, every firm China has, first of all, isn't audited in any way, shape, or form. And while any firm has a contractual basis where all the information flows back to the CCP, right, the Communist Party. And so when Europe is going that route, right, to get free infrastructure because they're in trouble, uh, we have grave reservations about that. Thank goodness this COVID has exposed uh, China uh, and these relationships. And so now I think we're making friends uh, by the day, right? Australia was teetering. We're good with them. India now is tough ally with us. Uh, so it's not like we're not making friends and Secretary Pompeo 
uh, has made strong uh, initiatives into Africa on, on several fronts that are you know, in the billion dollar range. So we don't want to step back. Uh, I think everybody, Sub-Saharan African leaders are seeing what, uh, what China is really like after you start doing business with them. And they are very upset with China now as well, especially after the uh, coronavirus. And so uh, it, 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 the U.S. is you know, going to be the key in terms of a, of a Marshall Plan. And it, it is key that we do sell the American people on that. And there's very good rationale, right? Strate- setting up the strategic uh, initiatives for our own security is number one that Jonas Biru you know, points out in his work. And uh, China, I don't want to keep beating the same dead horse, but you know, Joe Biden, yeah. when, he, when his VP flew over and his kid got a billion dollar deal. And so when I'm saying our politicians are bought off, they are bought off by China. So why isn't our governance doing anything? I was one of the few free market guys. My own party gave me nothing because I actually voted my free market principles that I didn't yeah. want the state running everything. So we got some uphill uh, work to do to get a Marshall Plan going for Africa. Thank you. Th- thank you, Dave. Uh, Aubrey, let me swing back to you. Uh, in our opening remark, Dambisa pointed out that Vera Songwe, the head of the UNEC, had uh, referred to the CFTA as the African version of the Marshall Plan. And you've recently uh, interviewed uh, uh, the CFTA Secretary General and have written on this subject. How do you react to Vera's comments on on how could the United States be supporting the CFTA? Is that indeed an alternative or a complement to to a possible Marshall Plan initiative? Thanks, Gabriel. Um, first, to, to as Dimbisa said, you know, I wish uh, Vera was on this panel. Sure. I have great esteem for her. She tweeted that like two years ago, so I think that you know her tweet is uh, taken a little bit out of context in many ways. Um, but uh, listen, the view that free trade within the region can be a driver of economic recovery is an important one. And I think the Secretary General holds that view as as does many African leaders, because uh, the idea of global trade coming back anytime soon at the magnitude and volume that it was at uh, is just not a reality. So, you know, the only way is to unleash new uh, opportunities through trade that was kind of pent up. Uh, and to find areas of economic growth that were a result of inefficiency. So, you know, we know that the region as a whole is going to have its first recession in 25 years. It varies enormously. Nigeria is probably contracting at somewhere around 4% uh, right now is the estimate, whereas Kenya still can can continue to grow at slightly under 1%. But it does mean that people are getting poor every day. Unemployment is growing. The informal sector is growing. Uh, And and because of that, you need to address inefficiencies. And one of the inefficiencies happens to be that there are 54 borders to cross uh, and regulatory uh, frameworks to navigate in very, very small markets. So unleashing the power of the uh, larger market will stimulate economic growth, as well as things that happen in the kind of trade facilitation realm. So digitizing customs, digitizing borders, those type of things can stimulate economic growth. I don't like to use the term Marshall Plan because the Marshall Plan was a very specific thing. Even like when you talk about Belt and Road, it's not a Marshall Plan. That is the Chinese government basically doing support of its own companies, doing projects abroad. It's not creating productivity on the ground in African markets. It's not direct transfers to the African private sector. It's not focused on increasing African productivity. I mean, maybe some of the infrastructure built as a result will, but it's not, it shouldn't be called a Marshall Plan, nor should the African Continental Free Trade Agreement be called a Marshall Plan. It's fundamentally not one, but it is a driver of economic recovery. Good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Aubrey. Uh, Dambisa, let me, let me swing to you. Uh, as uh, Aubrey said, unleashing the uh, productivity and efficiency gains of a larger market in the face of a contracting African economy, will that do those two square off uh, properly in your view? Well, listen, so even before COVID hit, as I alluded to in my introductory remarks, we're already in a pretty tenuous position from the perspective of the global economy. 
Um, not only had we had multiple periods of low economic growth, um, but public policy, as I mentioned earlier, was already pretty impotent. Um, we have developed countries that before COVID were in negative interest rate environments like Russia and Japan. We have countries like the United States that are not only, no matter what they say about China, the US government still has China as its number one foreign lender. Um, so heavily integrated, heavily dependent on China. Um, we had a situation where there was a multitude of headwinds um, that really not just Africa, but the global economy is ill prepared for, whether it's the risk of technology and the risk of a jobless underclass, demographic shifts. I mean, the population of the world is, is, is really rapidly increasing towards 11 billion people um, by 2100, according to the UN. India is adding a million people a month to its population. We had issues of income inequality. Um, we've had 30 years in the United States where the so social mobility has come down by 50%. Um, that is completely antithetical and eroding the whole idea of an American dream. Climate change, we haven't even mentioned climate change um, and the consequences of climate change and how they've got knock-on effects to disruptive and disorderly migration, which today stands at roughly 70 million people who are essentially um, dis uh, dislocated or, or uh, refugees, according to the International uh, Rescue Commission. We have debt. Um, I, you know, I don't even need to get into that, but I will say the Congressional Budget Office has talked about the fact that by 2030, now 10 years away, um, we have a situation where the United States and many European countries will be unable to sustain their, um, their social programs, social security, uh, Medicare, Medicaid. And then of course, as, as um, Aubrey mentioned a moment ago, we have an issue of productivity. Um, there's, there's been a, a rapid decline in productivity um, to levels that are not, and, and for people who aren't economists, um, there are three drivers of growth, capital, labor and productivity. Um, by many estimates, productivity explains up to 60% of why one country grows and another one does not. So if you have problems with productivity, which we have seen not just in Africa, but across the world, um, then we really have a, a long-term um, scenario where economic growth um, will, will continue to stall way below that 3% number, the 3% um, rule of 72, 3% magic number that you need to be growing at to double per capita incomes in a generation. So that is the backdrop we were facing before COVID-19. What COVID-19 has done is to accelerate a lot of these problems. Um, and the best that we can expect from society is to really step in to try and mitigate the risk so that we don't end up with a situation where living standards are materially deteriorated and human progress is stalled, um, not just in the for, for the short term, but for the long term. How do we get that sorted? And, and to me, this idea of a Marshall Plan is really to, to act as a mitigant um, to some of the challenges that I've outlined here, which are very deep, very structural. And unfortunately, and I think um, Dr. Bratt was um, really getting into this point, that we have short-term cycles in uh, public policy in terms of politics, which are undermining our, our ability to come up with long-term solutions, um, which are the ones that I just outlined, the deep structure problems in terms of education, in terms of healthcare infrastructure that take multiple generations to solve. So this is a long-winded way of saying, you know, I'm trying to solve for um, an immediate and urgent problem, um, recognizing that if we get off of base, um, with this intervention, with an intervention today, it means that we're, we are even further away from longer term solutions on the whole range of problems that I just uh, announced and, and mentioned here a moment ago. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dambisa. As we begin to uh, wind down, let, let me just uh, throw this out very broadly. In the face of this uh, global environment we're in, or Africa is in, uh, contracting economies uh, and the impact of COVID. Where are the uh, points of hope? Uh, where, where do we see optimism? What are the basis? Okay, we've talked about technology and trade and so on, but uh, for the African, for the average African, uh, where, where is the, the point of hope uh, in the midst of all this? Uh, Dave, do you want to? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I like what Dambiza was just saying with respect to education. Uh, we've got an issue here, uh, but the younger generation, the kids, uh, they actually like their parents for the first time in world history. That's a new variable. And they want to do good in the world. And so if you look at relationships like between the U.S. and Africa, 
Uh, there's going to be a natural affinity going forward. That we're we're global, right? The kids have technology at their fingertips, uh, and I think what the, the positive note for Africa and us, and, but this requires a big shift because we got a lot of folks working against this. Is that business is morally good, right? In my own tradition, the Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, for the first thousand years, it wasn't considered morally good, and so that it, it's just a simple piece. Uh, but if the African nations can reach out to us, right, we're having racial issues here. Uh, none of it needs to be. There's no upper bound on growth, right? There's no upper bound on the number of kids uh, in our cities that can get rich. Uh, but you got to first say business is good. And uh, so I think Africa can be, can be a great partner with us in spreading that message. They not only is it good, we need it with you. We need to partner with you. We can all be children of God together. And there's my hope for the day. Good. Okay, uh, Aubrey, do you want to build on what you said, a uh, few, few of the points you've made? Sure. So, you know, I think there are several areas of optimism. Um, you know, I think some countries are not wasting this crisis and are addressing inefficiencies, long-held inefficiencies around digitization in particular, uh, around dependence on cash. Uh, these high transaction cost elements if they can be eliminated, then the economies that will come out of the COVID uh, recession period will be more efficient and structured for growth long term. Um, also, I think there's a lot of opportunity for uh, strong relationships on a people to people soft power level with the US, uh, because I do think the kind of emergence of of African creative sectors, whether that be Nigerian music that's gone global, whether it's Netflix doing uh, shows uh, produced by Africans, filmed in Africa, uh, that kind of collaboration brings those people to people ties very strongly. And I think that's an asset we have that the Chinese don't necessarily have, and we should double down in that area. Um, I'm optimistic about the new DFC. Um, because of the perceived uh, competition with China, the global competition with China, we got the Build Act in October 2018, which greatly expanded OPIC, gave it new powers, expanded its uh, lending capacity to $60 billion, and it really enhanced new tools. Likewise, we got US XM Bank working again, which it was more, to, it was more bound for basically eight years. So... <clears throat> We really do have uh, the tools in our toolbox to, to support U.S. companies to make new investments in the region. Uh, so, you know, I'm optimistic about the potential there. Excellent. Uh, Dambisa, uh, points of optimism? Yes. No, I'm an eternal optimist. Um, I think that uh, Oprah's done a good job of picking up on some of the points I would make. Um, I've talked about technology. I mean, technology has the opportunity not only to reduce the cost structure of food production, transportation, communication, but really to get at the heart of a lot of the public goods, um, the delivery of public goods that we've struggled with. So something like education. Yes, there's some initial data that says this is much harder a task, but I really believe in areas of public policy and technology um, can help solve um, concerns around education and healthcare as a starter. Um, so I remain very optimistic about um, the things that we have seen and, and perhaps not seen yet um, around, uh, around technology. I'm not claiming it will be linear and there are lots of, for every positive upside um, story, somebody I'm sure will rustle up something negative that needs to be mitigated and monitored. But I think fundamentally, um, this technology gives us an opportunity to circumvent a lot of the, the bottlenecks and challenges um, that uh, institutions laden with, with bureaucracy and with, uh, with corruption have, have, have halted. Um, the other point I would just make is, and I think this is picking up on Aubrey's point again, um, I do think that this crisis will be a real opportunity to to really reveal, as Warren Buffett says, those people who've been swimming naked. Um, and in this particular context, I think it's about public policymakers. Public policymakers that have not delivered in terms of quality and quantity um, of, of uh, public goods, as I said, education, healthcare, infrastructure, are now going to be taken to the test. Um, they're yeah. simply in a world where there's demand around social and uh, a cultural change. Um, those, country, those countries, those politicians who will be um, backfooted, um, I think will be 
um, will now be ended and basically targeted for the for the history books. Um, and in that respect, I remain very optimistic about uh, what might come out of this crisis. Thank you. Brilliant, brilliant. I I I think that's a very uh, good note to end on. A point of optimism, uh, as you say, the, the tide is down, and we can see who's swimming naked and who's not. So that's a, a very good point to end on. Let me just, for my part, say thank you. Thank you to all three of you and our panelists and uh, to the uh, people who've been sending in messages. Let me say thank you very much. And I'll hand it over to Brahman, who will now uh, make a closing statement. Thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for joining us today, and particularly thank you to our panelists. That was an amazing conversation. It was so wide ranging and comprehensive, and it added a tremendous amount of value and specificity to this discussion of the Marshall Plan. Um, from my perspective, I, I really think there's only one thing that we didn't tackle um, in our conversation, and, and that is frankly, you know, amidst all of the references to monopolies and the golden age, and the self-interest that underlay the original Marshall Plan. We haven't talked about American business and specifically their lack of interest in Africa. The lack of conviction that they have that Africa is essential to their bottom lines or will be in the future. And that in my mind is fundamentally the difference between China and the United States. China gets it. China knows that it needs Africa to succeed. And if American businesses believe that, we would have a Marshall Plan. Because as Dr. David Brad was saying, it's not the American people who set policy. It's not politicians who set policy. It's, it's businesses and their lobbyists who set policy in this country. So if we can persuade them, and, and Aubrey referenced the DFC, the new Development Finance Corporation, um, through that vehicle or others that American businesses can succeed in Africa, I think there's nothing that we can't accomplish. A final note. Vera Songwe has been summoned so much in this conversation, and the Africa Center is scheduled to tape an interview with her as soon as the internet comes back on in Ethiopia. We will ask Vera to comment on her comments on the Marshall Plan, and we will be sure to tweet out her update. Um, again, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Gabriel Nagatu, for your masterful moderation of this talk. We'll look forward to seeing you again. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.